Happy Father's Day to all of you. Whoa. It's great to see a new father like Jay get up here and read the scriptures today. I was trying to pull the toes on his little baby girl today, but I don't know if she liked that or not. But he's a brand new father. Some of us are old fathers. We've been at this business a long time and grandfathers and all the rest of it. It's good to see all of you, and there's a lot of absent fathers today that we're missing that have gone on before. I'm thinking of my wife's dad, Billy Phillips, who was with us for some time. You know, we had lots of good times with him. He's the guy that taught me how to grill a steak. I'd never eaten a steak until he grilled one for me, and it was medium rare, and I said, wow, that's the way it's supposed to be. We used to ride down the Tennessee River with him on his boat, went on vacations together, spent lots of nights in his house, missing him, missing a lot of other dads that are gone from us today. Happy Father's Day. You know, I want to preach God's Word to you today. I don't care if it's Father's Day, Mother's Day, or St. Patrick's Day, or whatever it is. My mission today is to talk to you about being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're here. If you're brand new, you're just checking Christianity out, I'm glad you're here. If you're trying to figure out what church is about, I'm glad you're here. If you don't really get what we're doing here all together, I'm glad you're here. And wherever you are on your journey, I'm glad you're here. I hope you'll be blessed by what we talk about today. We've been in a series about discipleship, about what it really means to be followers of Jesus. We've talked about reluctant disciples and committed disciples and uncertain disciples. Brandon did a great job last week talking to us about doing and being doers and the power that's unleashed when we all do. If we'll just do stuff, little things. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, James 1, James 1 We all know the scripture. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, we think about stuff, we plan stuff. Nike says what? Just do it. <laughs> See, that's what we need to do in the little and big and small ways. Matthew seven twenty four. everyone who hears these words of mine and what? And does them shall be likened to a wise man that built his house upon the rock. Jesus and that lawyer, you know, Brandon was telling us about the good Samaritan and that that lawyer quoted all the commands of, of God and Jesus said simply to him, do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Okay, so so what does it take today to be the kind of people that live in the moment, that sees the moment to do the will of God when the opportunity comes. Well, there's basically three things we're going to cover today. First of all, it takes a mindset about me, about you, about ourselves. How do you think of yourself as you go about your days? How do you look at your own person, your own self? That's number one. Second is, we've got to open our eyes and look. We've got to have an increased awareness of the people that are around us And the third thing we got to do if we do those two things is we got to act in the moment, seize the moment and act. You know, on one extreme, when people come to Jesus, when they learn the message of Jesus, when they learn of his love, when they give their lives to Jesus, they think about not sinning. Think about scriptures like Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? God forbid, how can we who died to sin live any longer therein? So on the one hand, we say being a Christian means I try not to sin. So we, we, we try to, to avoid sin. You know, some people, they've never really changed their thinking. That God has never really changed their mind. They're the same old person they always were, but they're trying to avoid sin. They want to sin. They're looking forward to the next time they can sin, but they just try to avoid sin. Uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> that's not going to work. See, just trying to avoid sin is not all there is to it. But see, there's, there's, a, there's a paradigm shift. There's a death to sin, Romans 6 says, that changes the way we look at ourselves. Romans 6, verse 6, after it talks about being united with Christ in baptism, it says, knowing this, that our old man, our old person was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away so that we might no longer serve sin. 
Has there been a deep change in you because of what God has done in your life that changed the way you even think about sin? The way you even uh, perceive it in your mind. But on the other hand, see, there's another side to this coin. On the other hand, there is the positive side of Christianity, which is not just avoiding evil. Well, I don't do this, and 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 I must be a good Christian because I don't do all that bad stuff. No. It's not about just avoiding evil. It's about doing those positive things of the will of God. And so when we come to Jesus Christ, we begin to think of ourselves in a different way. Romans 6, 11 says, so then consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Old King James says, reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin. What does reckon? You know, people used to say, I reckon. What what does that mean? It means I'm thinking. I think that way. To consider yourself, to, to think about yourself. When you look in the mirror, when you perceive yourself in your own mind, how do you think of yourself? Well, this verse says that people that have really let God change their minds think of themselves as dead unto sin. I don't live for sin anymore. I'm not that person. I don't live for sin. How else do they think of themselves? I'm alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Romans 6, 10, the verse right before this says of Jesus, the death that he died, he died to sin once. The life that he now lives, he lives for God So also you consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Let's get into that a little bit more. How do you think of yourselves? Paul said, I, Galatians 2.20, have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Who loved me and gave himself for me. Colossians 3.1, talking about baptized Christians who have undergone a change that the word of God has worked in their heads. If then you are raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your affection, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. For you died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. What does that mean? It means that every day as we go out of our house, every day as we get up and go out into our world, we consider ourselves and say, I live for Christ. See, it's just a foregone conclusion in my mind. I live for Christ. I don't live for me. I live for Christ. You know, we, we all know Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. You can't change it by yourself. You gotta let God's word in where you really think about it. And changing your mindset, considering yourself dead unto sin and alive unto God is really in three parts. It happens when you allow the word of God to convict you. You say, I know God. Yes, that's right. I see the truth of that. It happens when you let the word of God change or convert you. That means it changes your attitude about things. That's conversion. And then it happens when you allow the word of God to bring you to a commitment. You begin to decide to do things differently than you did them before. Conviction, conversion, and commitment. See, that's how this comes about. So we talk about giving ourselves to God. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 5, Paul's talking about the Thessalonians and the Philippians, the people of Macedonia. He said, they did not do as we expected, but first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us in keeping with God's will. What does that look like? What that looks like is it's inside of your head, see, when you really honestly begin to think of yourselves, as Romans six eleven says, as dead to sin and live to God in Christ, that you say to yourself every day, I live for God. I live for Christ. As I go into my family, my home, I live for Christ. As I go to my work, I live for Christ. See, I am a servant of Christ. So this new mindset <clears throat> brings new results. See, if you have this distinct mindset, I think one of our problems is, and Stan, we've been talking about, 
you know, how can we really be disciples? How can we really do the will of the Lord in all the little ways in this community and be powerful for God in our discipleship? But, but the problem is we, we don't let God really change our minds and we don't go about our lives with a changed mind. We still think we live for ourselves. We really don't say and conceive of ourselves that I live for God. And the results is, are, I'm going to be a servant of Christ today in my home. I'm going to be a servant of Christ at my job. Today when I go in the bank, I'm going to be a servant of Christ. Today in the health club, I'm going to be Christ's person. Today when I'm drinking coffee with those women, I'm going to be Christ's person. Today when I'm with those kids and with the moms and dads of my kids at the ball game, I'm going to be serving Christ among those people, see? Because I have that mindset, I live for Christ. So point number one, church, we got to change here. We got to let God change our mindset so that we do Romans six eleven. Do it. Don't just read it. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive unto God in Christ Jesus. That brings us to point two. It's really complicated. Look, look. You know, what do you see in this crowd in downtown Paducah? You see a cop over there, he's tired, he's hot. You just go over him or ignore him, there's a cop. You know, you go up to him and this, this is some guy, he's probably a family man. I appreciate what you're doing, how's your family doing? Appreciate you being out here on a Saturday keeping us safe, what's your name? You know, how's it going? Uh, uh, you, do you need a drink over here? I can get you a drink. See, we don't just see the crowd, we see the cop and we see him himself, not just a uniform. Maybe there's a single woman over there with a couple of kids, you know, and she's dragging them along and she's haggard. <clears throat> she's not just a face in the crowd, she's a person. And we engage and we look and we see. Uh, my family gets irritated with me because I see animals. I mean, I see them everywhere. I see them all over the place. When I'm driving down the road, I see animals. Uh, I sent little, uh, what's his name? Uh, Brandon's little son, Tyler. I sent, he was wanting to see the animals out behind my house and took him to see April's chickens and everything and the cow and everything. And a cow was a big deal to him, you know, and just a cow. But there's deer out there and I, I wanted to show him a deer. And, and right the day they left, I saw a grass out there and right in the top of the grass, there was a set of ears. I look for that stuff. I look for ears in the grass. Most people don't. But I took a shot of the grass and those ears sticking up and said, what do you see? See? Well, there's a deer. <clears throat> and I see stuff like that all the time. Why? Because I look for it. I've been looking for it since I was a little bitty boy. Some people look for metal everywhere. They go around with those little metal detectors, you know, de -de 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 looking in the ground. And everywhere they are, they, they look for metal. They find metal. They see a little glint and they say, oh, there's metal. Why do they see it? Because they're looking for it. See? And as I go about my day every day, wherever I am, I look for souls. <clears throat> I look for good and honest hearts. I look for seekers. I look for people who will be open to the word of God. <clears throat> what do you see in the crowd? When you go into the bank, what do you see? Well, I got to look. I got business to do. I got to make a deposit. I got to do this and that. I got to check on these papers. I got appointment down here. I'll tell you what I see. I see Jacob. And Jacob's got a new little baby girl. And I ask him how he's doing with his baby girl and how his wife's doing. And he's raising a vegetable garden and he wants to maybe help us give to some of the uh, uh, less fortunate here in Paducah by giving some of the proceeds of his garden. And I see Renee, who's worked for the bank for 38 years and her husband's just recently retired, you know. And I see Brenda over there who lives across the river, you know. And I see Matthew, who's going to be moving over to May, uh, Mayfield in a little bit, because those are people to me, see? And I'm trying to build relationships with those people. When I go into Walmart, what do I see? I see a couple of ladies that have attended our ladies' class here before, and I'm trying to establish some rapport with them. I see Doris, who's had cancer, and she's still been working there, a little bitty skinny woman, as sweet as she can be, you know? And I see those other people. What do you see? When you go into Walmart, we just pass people. We need to look. We need to open our eyes and see. What did the good shepherd see when he went out in Luke 15, Brandon? What was he looking for? He was seeing sheep, wasn't he? 
And he was looking all through those hills and mountains, and he was looking for a sheep. His eyes were focused on finding sheep. In John 4, verse 35, when Jesus had just finished talking to the woman at the well, and she'd gone back into the village of Sychar, and those people were coming out of the village, and the disciples had bought some food, and they brought it to Jesus, and they said, okay, lunch, lunch. And they're all in, their heads are in their lunch sacks, and they're breaking out the bread, and breaking out the water, and whatever else they had. Jesus said, look, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. They're white under harvest. There were people coming out of there. And Jesus saw those people. <clears throat> How many people do we pass every single day? We're on the treadmill at the health club. How many people do we ignore all around us every day? Uh, you know, we're, we're at the drinking coffee there at the, with the ladies or something. How many people do we ignore, you know? Engage people. Uh, befriend people, contact people, ask about people, look, open your eyes. Folks, we're, we're not going to do what we were being urged to do last week. We're not going to seize those moments unless our eyeballs are open and we're looking and we see people and we reach out and do those little things. The littlest of them is just speaking. And if you get a good response, asking a little bit about them and building a relationship, look. So get the right mindset and then open your eyes and look. This is really a complicated one too. Number three, present. You could say offer. Uh, you could say a lot of things. This is the Romans 6 passage, you know, that we've been talking about. But uh, put it this way. Can you tell if people are ready to go to work or not? You see, um, these guys in this picture, they've got their gloves, they've got their hammers, they've got their helmets, they showed up. They don't look like guys that are just thinking about working. They look like guys that are ready to fall out there on that thing and go to work. I used to work for Albertson's country, uh, company, and I would work the 11 to 7 shift, 11 at night, 7 in the morning, and we'd come to work, and there'd be a truck sitting there, a semi at the back, and uh, we'd slide open the door of that truck, and we didn't sit there and think about it, you know, plan about it. We just crawled up in the back of that truck and started throwing cases, and we unloaded that semi. <clears throat> we were ready to work. Uh, when I was 12, I learned the meaning of work. Some of my friends that worked for the Valentine Ranch, a little bit outside of Casper, Wyoming, they said we need some hands to haul hay be there at six o'clock or whatever the time was and be ready to work. So we had our jeans on, we had our gloves on, we had our caps on, we had everything and there was a wagon and the wagon started off and we didn't think a lot about it and plan a lot about it. We just started grabbing bales of hay and throwing them up there. We were ready right when? When were we ready to go to work? Right now. Ahora, immediately, right now, at this moment, we were ready to go to work. There's an expectation when you're ready to go to work. Well, I'm not ready yet. I got to, you know, there's an expectation that I'm fixing to fall on that right now. There is an eagerness when we're ready to go to work. We can't wait to jump. <clears throat> Let's get this thing unloaded. We're burning daylight pilgrim. There is a focus when you're ready to go to work. We're, we're, we're getting after it right now. And you know, when we do these yards for people, we fall out there and we start raking leaves. There's focus. There's a let's do this thing right now. See, that's what we mean when we say present yourselves to God, not just in general. Listen, listen to me, church. Generalized Christianity is worthless Christianity. If we stay general, if we stay generic, it's real broad. We don't get anything done. Doing things is specific. It's right in the moment. It's with particular people in particular situation. It happens right now when we do things, when the opportunity arises. In Romans 6, verse 16, he says, do, not, do you not know that to whomever you present yourselves? That means you show up for work. As obedient slaves, you are the slaves of one whom you obey, whether of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Picture it this way. All right, I'm getting up. I'm going to leave my house, and all of a sudden, I, I present myself to Jesus. I live for you, Jesus. So there's Jesus, and he's walking with me, and he says, wait a minute. You're about to leave your house. 
you need to go tell your wife you love her and you need to give her a kiss and you need to tell her how much she means to you before you go, okay, Jesus. So you go do that because that's what he wants you to do. And you've got your little daughter over there and you need to go tell her that you love her and tell her that God loves her and tell her something good about herself and then leave your house, okay? So he's walking with you and you, you're walking through the bank and, and there's a young man you haven't met. He, he, Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, go talk to that young man. When? Now? Yes, right now. So you go, hey, I'm Dan. What's your name? And you talk to him right now. And you begin to start up a relationship. You're in the restaurant and that harried lady has been trying to serve you and maybe not getting there. And Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, you need to leave her a good tip. And you need to say something nice to her. And you need to leave her one of those cards that has that scripture on the back that says something encouraging for her day. And so you go ahead and do it and you do it right now. You're looking over there one day and, and, and you're at home in your neighborhood and you're about to go out and trim your hedges and you see your, your neighbors unloading something over there. And Jesus taps you on the shoulder and says, get over there right now and help that guy unload that stuff and say hello to him and, and strike, strike up a conversation and, and be salt and light in the earth. You walk into work and there's one of your coworkers over there and you can just tell that he's dragging. His jaws dropped. You can tell he's not doing good. Jesus says, get over there to that guy and put your arm around him right now and ask him what's going on and say, how's it going? And if he's got a problem, pray with him about it right now. Do it now, says Jesus. See, that's the way we are when we're presenting ourselves in the moment to God. Romans six thirteen. do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. In other words, I'm not ready to sin right now. I'm not doing that. But present yourselves to God with your work gloves on, with your helmet on, whatever, as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. One day recently when we were in Israel, we'd had a hot day and a hard day. And uh, it, I don't know how many hours we'd already been going, but there were two or three of us that decided that we had had enough for the day. We were dead meat. And we said, we're going to go back to the hotel. It's probably five or six o'clock, five o'clock. And so we went to the dung gate in Jerusalem. We were hot and tired at the dung gate. And there were taxis out there in the street. And we said, oh, yeah, we're going to get a taxi and we're going to go back to the, to the hotel. And so we went up to the taxi driver and he said, no, no ride. No ride. Not available. No, no ride. Go, no, no right. And there were taxis there, but they were unavailable. Let me ask you a question, church. What hours are you available to serve Jesus? How often and when is your sign hung out in your taxi for Jesus? It says not available. Are you available on Monday mornings? Are you available to serve Jesus on Thursday afternoons? How about your Friday nights? Are you available? How about Saturdays? Are you available? When does Jesus want, him to, want us to serve him? Right here, right now. Look around this room right now. There are people in this room that need you to say hello to them, that need you to meet them, that need you to hug them, that need you to encourage them. Do it now. Say, do it right when we say amen. Now is the time. Go to that next slide if you would. These are some guys, very briefly, that did exactly what we're talking to. Remember Paul and Silas in uh, Acts 16 when they cast the demon out of that girl and she couldn't foretell the future anymore and the owners got mad and they put them in jail and put their feet in stocks and beat them up really bad and Paul looks at Silas and Silas looks at Paul and they're in jail in the stinking jail and they said, you know what, all these prisoners here don't know Jesus, let's sing some songs about Jesus. So they took the moment and they started singing some songs about Jesus right there, right then. And there was an earthquake and the jails uh, flew open and, and the jailer came in. He was about to kill himself. And Paul said, don't hurt yourself. And Paul thought, you know, there's a guy that's in a vulnerable moment. Let's talk to Jesus, uh, to talk about Jesus to him maybe ne ne next week. No, he said, let's do it right now. And Paul did. And baptized him and his family at midnight right there. See Daniel over there in the other right-hand corner up there? 
Daniel had been among all these guys and they were jealous of him and they made this law, you know, that nobody prays to anybody but uh, King Darius and they knew Daniel was a praying guy and the law came down and the decree was made and everybody was around and Daniel said, what am I going to do? He said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my room and I'm going to open my windows. When am I going to do it? I'm going to do it right now. And I'm going to pray to my God so everybody can see that I'm praying to God like I do every day. And I'm going to ask his blessing. And God is going to give me an opportunity to shine for him right now in this moment. Look right down below Daniel. That's Nehemiah. And he was a slave in Persian captivity serving the king, his wine. And he knew that Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. And he knew the guy could kill him if he wanted to. But he said, I'm fixing to go in there to the most powerful man on earth. And I've got an opportunity. Lord, help me. I'm going to do it right now. And he went in there and he asked King Artaxerxes if he could take a bunch of people and go back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And the king said, yes. And how much material do you need? And I'll help you every way I need to. Why did that work out? Because he did the will of God right now when the opportunity presented. And you see down there in the other corner, you see Paul standing before Agrippa. A few weeks ago, we were in the ruins of that palace where Paul was speaking to Agrippa and and Festus and all those people. But anyway, Paul was on trial, and he'd been in jail two years, and they were dragging him out, and they were going to let him speak before the king before they sent him to Rome, and he sees all these people all around. There's Roman soldiers, there's dignitaries, there's the king, there's the governor all sitting there, and he says, you know what? When am I going to have an opportunity like this, even though I'm on trial? When am I going to have an opportunity to tell this many people the gospel of Christ? I think I'm going to tell my story, but I'm going to preach him the gospel. When am I going to do it? I'm going to do it right now. And he did, see? And that was Paul's modus operandi. When we present ourselves to God in the moment of opportunity, that's when we do stuff. And that's when the power of God is unleashed in our community by the disciples of Christ. Our daily prayer... Every day, as we get up and go out this week, we should say, Lord, please use me today. Please use me in this moment. Please use me in all of my appointments today. Please use me right now, today, to do your will. So how can we seize the moment? Three simple things. Number one, we got to start thinking of ourselves differently, like Romans 6, 11 says, I live for God. That's who I am. Number two, we got to open our eyes and look. We've got to begin seeing people all around us and seeing their needs and seeing them and connecting with them. And number three, we've just got to present ourselves ready and just seize the moment and do the Lord's will in the moment. I think this is Bible. I think this is what God wants us to do. I hope that God will convict your heart with it. And man, the power we can unleash in this community this week, if we just do little things all week long, In the name of Jesus Christ. If we can help you and respond to the Lord's invitation, we'd love to do that. If you'd like to study the Bible, let us know that. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand together, as we sing.